week, as the coronavirus has become a pandemic across the world, most of us have seen things that we've never seen before in our lifetime, even some of us older people. Due to the concern and the fears connected with the spread of the virus, we've seen schools, professional sports leagues, major events, and many other businesses completely shut down. Some people have been totally gripped with fear. Other people are not concerned about it at all. And still others fall somewhere in the middle. And the statistics and information out there on the internet varies widely. I think I saw this week that, you know, there was like three to 5,000 deaths. And I saw another thing that said 100,000. And I, mean, I, just, I, I don't know about you guys, but I just saw all kinds of crazy things all over the uh, the spectrum. And so the last thing in the world that I intend to do with this message is pretend to be an expert on viruses or on containing the spread of them or acting like I know what's really going on throughout the world. I don't. I don't know what's going on uh, with it. There are other people who are a lot more qualified than me to speak on those types of things. So in this message, the purpose of it is not to pass judgment for or against the shutting down of major organizations. And uh, also before beginning uh, this message, I think it's important that we as a church extend our love and compassion and concern to those who have lost loved ones and those who have found themselves in extraordinary hardship during this crisis. Real suffering has come to many people through this virus, and I don't think it's loving or godly to minimize that in any way. So our hearts should be tender towards those people. And so my goal for tonight in this message is simply to labor to try and provide some biblical encouragement by meditating on the God who is enthroned over all things, including the coronavirus. And my hope is to help you have real biblical peace and some real encouragement and some real hope that is rooted in the truth of Scripture so that not only will you yourself have peace, but you'll be equipped to walk through whatever situation you might find yourself in in relation to this pandemic. So I realize that even from this standpoint, the standpoint of thinking about God in relation to this, we're not going to say everything that needs to be said tonight. That, there's not one sermon that can cover everything. Uh, but hopefully this message will at least begin to provide some sort of biblical grounding and some sort of encouragement. Uh, and maybe it will be used by God to begin to lead to discussing other good and helpful things that should be talked about. And so if something you think about goes undressed, unaddressed in this message and said, you didn't say this or that, like you're right. I, I can't say everything or we'll be here till next week. Um, and also for all who are here at the service tonight or for who might be listening online, we're going to have the notes to this message posted on our website and they will contain all of the scripture references. So I will be referencing a lot of scriptures and if you feel like you can't keep up, it's okay. It'll all be in the notes. Now, <clears throat> let's go ahead and begin our message with all that introductory stuff being out of the way. Uh, I think the key starting point for us tonight is to know first and foremost, there is a God who lives and who rules and who reigns and who governs everything, including the coronavirus. And so for all who know him, for all who know his truth and who know his ways, there is no reason for us to be paralyzed with fear. Instead, with compassion and hope and love and with courage and with wisdom and with the understanding that comes from God's word, hopefully we as his people will be lights in a dark and hopeless place. And we will be able to do that because of the precious, precious truths of God's word. The Bible tells us that God is a God who is in absolute and total control of all things. And I'll give you a few scriptures demonstrating that. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 through 3 tells us that Jesus created all things. And that through the mighty word of his power, Jesus is presently sustaining all things and holding them together. Daniel chapter 2 verse 21. That passage tells us that God raises up kings, God removes kings, God changes times, He changes seasons, and that if there are any people on earth who have any sort of understanding, wisdom, or knowledge, they all have it because God gave it to them. 
Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus tells us that not even a tiny, insignificant, stupid little sparrow ever dies in the wilderness apart from the will of God. Here's a pause real quick. I hate that saying, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and makes a noise and no one's there to hear it, did it really make a noise? It's so arrogant. I hate that question. Yes, it made a noise. Just because a man isn't there doesn't mean that reality doesn't exist. Man's not the ultimate reality. God is. God's there. It made a noise. Sorry. <laughs> I, just, I hate that thing. It's so prideful. That's, it just puts man at the center of everything, which drives me nuts. God was there and God heard it. It happened. Yes, it was loud. And so anyways, Jesus tells in Matthew 10, 29, just a little seemingly insignificant sparrow never dies apart from the will of God. When you go out camping or driving through the mountains, do you ever stop and say, whoa, look at the sparrow and start taking a picture of a sparrow? No, you don't do that. We do that for bald eagles. We do that for grizzly bears. We don't do that for sparrows. Sparrows are just like, eh. They're unremarkable. Nevertheless, Jesus tells us not even one of these little unremarkable birds dies apart from the will of God. So he's in charge of sustaining the whole universe and removing kings and kingdoms and all this. And also the death of a little bird way out in the woods where nobody sees it. Jesus rules over all of that. So... <clears throat> If we understand the truth that God sovereignly rules all things and controls all things, if we understand those things correctly as a Christian and how the cross has made that remarkable for us, then we can realize that absolutely everything is dripping with hope and it's dripping with the presence of God. There's nothing he's not holding, even the death of a sparrow. And so... <clears throat> Part of God's sovereign and complete control over the universe is God's sovereign and complete control over your life. <clears throat> psalm 139 is a beautiful psalm about how much care and attention and detail our Creator God has put into making each one of us. If you read Psalm 139, verse 13 tells us that from our mother's womb, God formed all our inward parts and he knit us together according to his perfect plan. If you read verse 16, verse 16 tells us that before we even took physical form, God saw what we would be uh, when he made us. He could see your physical form before it ever even came into existence. Verses 1 through 7 of Psalm 139 tell us that God knows every single word that will be on our tongue before it comes out. He is familiar with every last one of our ways. He knows all of our thoughts. And there isn't one place we can go in all creation where we might escape His presence. And for the purposes of our message tonight in relation to the coronavirus... I think verse, I find verse 16 of Psalm 139 particularly helpful. Verse 16 tells us that part of the sovereign plan of God over our lives is the fact that before he ever made us, God has, de God has determined the exact number of days that we will live. In the ultimate sense, it is utterly impossible for you to die before the day that God determined will be the day of your death. And at the same time, it is utterly impossible for you to survive past the day that God ordained for you to die. And so throughout our lives, there may be times that we come near to death. Maybe we, we narrowly escape a major car accident or a soldier has bullets just miss killing him on the field of battle or a child almost runs out in front of a car, but thankfully the car swerves and the child is spared. These types of things happen to us in our lives. When I was 15 years old, I was coming home from a party that everyone was drinking at. And I think there were four or five of us in the car. And, uh, and the car got in an accident and it flipped over. I didn't even have my seatbelt on. I didn't get so much as a bruise. Nothing happened to me. 
at all. And not only nothing happened to me, nothing happened to anybody in the car. And none of us, there were at least four of us, none of us even had our seatbelts on. Now, the reason for this is the ultimate cause of our survival was God. He was not ready to take our lives yet. And so we have many near-death experiences, most of us, in this life. And the ultimate reason why they don't end in our death is God. Now, on the other hand, there are times in people's lives when the circumstances of their death are almost unexplainable. And they're so bizarre that it seems like everything had to line up just right in order for a person to die. The car had to swerve right into your lane at the exact right moment to hit you and cause your death. One split second sooner or one second later, if you would have stopped at the traffic light or not stopped at the traffic light, one little teeny detail, if it would have just been different, the accident would not have happened and you would have survived. Many deaths happen like that. And why is the timing so perfect to spare someone or to kill someone? Well, the primary reason why people die and why they survive is because in the ultimate sense, God is keeping them alive until we fulfill the days that he has determined for us. And once those days are fulfilled, we will not have one more day than we are given by God to live out. That's the primary ultimate reason. Now, having said that, I think it is also extremely important to recognize that in the carrying out of God's plan for our lives, God uses real choices and God uses real natural factors to either keep us alive or bring us to our death. God uses a mother who prevents her child from walking into oncoming traffic as an instrument of fulfilling God's plan for that child to live out his days. Her choice to grab the kid really mattered. It really did save the kid's life. It wasn't the primary cause, but it's a very real secondary cause. God really does use medicine to truly heal people as an instrument of preserving the healed person's life so that they can live out his plan for them. God really uses wise decisions to avoid needlessly and carelessly engaging overly dangerous circumstances to keep us alive so that his plan might be fulfilled in us. So it's important to recognize that God is the ultimate determiner of when we are born, where we are born, to whom we are born, how long we live and when we will die. God's the ultimate determiner of that. And when we realize this, this settles us with peace, knowing that our life and death is not ultimately in our own hands. Now, at the same time, as we realize that there are real causes in this life that keep us alive or cause our death, uh, and these causes are instruments of God to fulfill his plan for us, then this helps us to not just be like, like, ah, who cares? Let me go jump off the building or do like, like Satan tempted Jesus. Throw yourself off of this building. We don't live like that. Because we understand there are real choices that we make. Real natural causes that God uses to fulfill His plan. And so we respect that. While we trust that God's plan is ultimately going to come to pass. Now, just because God uses real human choices and real earthly circumstances to accomplish His will, I think it's also important to note that it doesn't mean God approves of everything that He uses to accomplish His will. For example, let's say someone commits a homicide. And through the homicide, the victim's life comes to an end according to the predetermined plan of God. That does not mean God approved of the sinfulness of the murder that ended the person's life. In fact, the word of God tells us God brings eternal judgment on these things. No murderer has eternal life in them. 1 John 3. So it's important from the outset to realize uh, these few things. Choices and circumstances, they are real and they matter. And there's something God takes seriously. 
And if we don't realize this, we're going to be reckless and foolish and put God to the test in sinful ways if we think our choices and actions have nothing to do at all with the outcome of our life. And so... <clears throat> We've stated that, and we've also established that God is 100% in control of all things. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm not sure how all of the mysteries of our real choices and, and, and natural events having real consequences, how does that fit together with God being in complete control? I'm not sure how all the mysteries of that play themselves out, but God's Word tell us, tells us that these things uh, are the case. Our choices matter. Real things happen. Job's family really experienced the collapse of the house through wind. Wind came and really knocked it down. And behind the wind was Satan, a spiritual power, doing, uh, bringing this wind. And behind that was God's sovereign will, bringing their death. How does all that stuff sort out? Of, I, I don't know. But I know all three things are present there. The wind really brought death. Satan was really in it. God was really in it. That's what the Word of God tells us. And so... <clears throat> Having established those things, <clears throat> what kind of choices should we make in relation to the coronavirus? I promise we're going to answer that question at the end, and I'm going to give you some specific biblical texts that I found helpful this week, but I want you to just hold that thought for a moment. I think it's important to lay out a few more things um, about God's sovereign rule, especially towards His church. And I want to begin by addressing some false teaching that I've seen in certain Christian circles in relation to the coronavirus this week. I don't know about you, but how many Facebook posts have you seen that in one way or another have taken a few scriptures and said, because they believe God's going to protect them from the coronavirus, God will definitely protect them because they have the faith. How many times have you seen that this week? I don't know about you, but I've seen that stuff circling around uh, on Facebook big time is people claiming God's protection uh, through faith. There are many, many, many problems with this kind of thinking. First of all, everywhere in the scripture, we see that God allows his people to go through suffering of all kinds. And when he does, it often has absolutely nothing to do with their lack of faith. Job was severely afflicted with boils. Job lost his property. He lost his family. And when his friends looked at him and said it was because of his sin, God strongly rebuked them for that view. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1-10, through 10, Paul said he had a thorn in the flesh that harassed him, this thorn weakened him, and that he had pleaded with God three times to take it away. But each time the Lord told him no. Now, the reason that God didn't remove the thorn from Paul was not because Paul lacked faith, but it's because God was using that thorn to humble Paul. And he wanted to teach Paul the sufficiency of his grace, and he wanted Paul to learn how to rely on God's power in his own weakness rather than his own. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 10. And so God's will for believers is not always to keep you healthy. It's not always to make you wealthy and it is not always to make things easy for you. Instead, what is God's will for believers? I mean, there's a lot of ways that you could answer the question, but <clears throat> the answer that I'm going to lean on tonight is found in Romans 8 verses 28 and 29. So if you want please... Uh, turn your Bibles to Romans 8, verse 28 through 29. And from this text, here's what I'm going to argue. God's will for you is to conform you to Jesus Christ. And He will use all of His divine power, His understanding, His wisdom, His grace, His love, and His resources to cause everything in your life to work in such a way that He uses those situations to conform you to the image of His Son. That's what I believe you could say. There's a lot of ways you can answer the question, what's God's ultimate will for the believer? But this is a valid answer that comes straight from a text. So let's look at Romans 8, verse 28 and 29. <clears throat> and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also pre- predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So I want you to look at the link between verse 28 and verse 29. Right after declaring that God works everything together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose in verse 28, Paul defines what the good is. God causes all things to work for your good. Well, how might a four-year-old interpret that? Four-year-old might say, oh, good. I get to have cake and candy and Coke for every meal for the next two weeks. Right, Leaf? Is that, is that maybe, or Zoe, is that, is that good? That might be how, how somebody might define that. How does Paul define the good? Here's the definition. <clears throat> for... Verse 29, or because those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the link. Right after declaring God works everything together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Paul tells us that we were foreknown and predestined to be fully conformed to the image of Christ. And so I believe we can say with biblical authority that when God works all things for the good of believers, the specific good he has in mind is at least conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. That's the good. There's a textual link there in verse 28 and 29. Now, we also know from Matthew 28, 20, that Jesus promised us he's always with us. We know from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, that God has said He will never leave us and He will never forsake us. If we keep reading even further in Romans 8, we know verses 35 through 39 tells us there is not any form of suffering or hardship that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And you could insert the coronavirus into that. And so suffering is not at all a sign that God doesn't love us. Instead, we are loved even through our suffering. God is still with us in suffering and God will lovingly use the suffering to conform us to Christ if we are his children through faith in the gospel. That's how he works everything for your good. Everything he uses to conform you to the image of Christ. He's sovereign over everything, including your death. Our choices really matter. And so taking that foundation we've already laid out, let's go ahead and think this through now in light of the coronavirus. All of us will rightly pray that God will protect us and our loved ones from getting the coronavirus. And for many of us, God will grant those requests. We will be protected and so will our loved ones. And as we experience this grace and kindness from God, if we think about the situation rightly, we're going to rejoice that God has protected us and God's protection, if we understand it rightly and and, and seek the Lord on it, it's going to help conform us to Christ. We will rejoice if we get through this thing without contracting the virus that just as God told Abraham in Genesis 15, 1 that he is Abraham's shield, so also we will experience God as our protective shield that has kept us from getting the virus. We will experience what it's like to have God deliver us from the deadly pestilence described in Psalm 91, 3. And so for those of us believers who do not contract the virus, as we get through this crisis with our health intact, we should be filled with awe and with gratitude to God who kept us totally safe and healthy through this crisis. And we should be all the more willing to use our preserved good health to serve God faithfully in his kingdom as our confidence in God as our shield increases. And for those whose health is protected and rightly understand that God has preserved your health so you can serve Him more and grow in Him in the kingdom of God, you will come out of this crisis not 
more eager to hold up and hoard more things to yourself, but more eager to serve Him freely and sacrificially, knowing that your health was spared for the glory of God, and that will make you more like Jesus. That will be some people's experience. For other believers, some of us will pray that we and our loved ones will be spared from this sickness. And in God's loving and wise purposes, some of us are going to get sick and catch the very virus that we prayed God would protect us from. His answer to our prayers will be no. And when this happens to some of us, it doesn't necessarily mean that we had less faith than those who were spared. And it also doesn't necessarily mean that we've sinned and God is judging us. Though the Bible does tell us, God will bring judgment like that into your life if you're walking in unrepentant sin. See 1 Corinthians 11 or Acts chapter 5. Uh, but, but for the most part, if we catch the virus, it doesn't mean we didn't have faith or that we had necessarily sinned. Instead, the believers who will get ill from this virus, they are getting ill because God knows uh, that going through this sickness is maximally going to serve His people's conformity to Christ. Real believers are very likely going to catch the virus. Even though with faith they prayed and prayed that God would spare them. The answer will be no for some people. I want us to think about If God gives you the virus as a believer, if the answer is no, in what ways might he conform you to Christ through that? I've dreamed up a couple of examples. We could do this all night. I by no means am covering everything. But here's a couple of examples. Maybe some of us lack compassion, especially in relation to physical illnesses and to physical suffering. And so if during this time God strikes your body and He causes you to suffer in the flesh, you will learn quickly how badly you want someone to care about your suffering. You will learn quickly how badly you want someone to be there for you and to show you compassion and to show you kindness. And as your body is suffering with a terrible illness, while you suffer for some of God's people, for for believers, God is going to meet you. And God is going to minister to you while you're going through these terrible times. And for those who survive, when you are healed, you're going to emerge with a far greater care and concern for others who suffer physically. And if God does a work in your heart through this sickness, you'll care a lot more about other people's physical suffering than you did before you got sick. And once you get through the sickness, you will then turn around towards sick people and towards those who suffer physically, and you will long to comfort them with the comfort that you received from God while you were sick. Where do I get that from the Bible? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 7 tells us that very thing. So some of us, the answer is going to be no. And God's going to grow our compassion for sick and suffering people. And as our compassion for sick and suffering people is increased because God gave us the sickness, we will be conformed to what? The image of Christ. Let's keep thinking this through. Some of God's people are going to get this sickness and perhaps some of God's people need to be humbled. Maybe they're very self-sufficient. They're very healthy. They kind of, even if it's not spoken, they think they're kind of the Lord over their life. And so God will bring this illness into our lives. And when you catch it, it will bring you straight to your knees and knock down your pride as you are terrified and realize there is nothing you can do to get rid of this sickness. And you don't know how it's going to end. You will not feel in control for a moment if you're on a respirator in a hospital that is crowded and you don't know how long they're going to give you the respirator for because there's a bunch of other people in the hospital. You're not going to feel very strong and self-sufficient at that time. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 
verses 7 through 10, tells us that things like illnesses, God uses those things specifically to strike a blow at our pride. Sometimes we get full of ourselves. We think that we're more important than we really are. uh, And we need something to come into our lives that will put us in check. And it may be that the coronavirus is God's instrument to do that. And if God uses this virus to bring us humility, then God is shown to be an extremely loving God for doing this. You know why? Here's why. James chapter 4 verse 6. 1 Peter 5, verse 5 and 6, Proverbs 3.34, and Psalm 138, verse 6. All of those passages tell us God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So when we rock, walk in pride, God's against you. He's resisting you, and you will lose. And so if you say in your pride, please keep me from getting sick, and God says, nope, And then the sickness brings you to a place of humility. It's through humility that God unloads grace on you. So that's not an unloving for God to say no for that reason would not be unloving on his part at all. So being humbled by a virus may be the very event that dissolves our pride and unlocks the floodgate of grace in our life. And then when we look back on it, contracting this virus could prove to be one of the greatest blessings of our lives because why? It made us more like Jesus for he is gentle and what in heart? Humble. And so one of the things God does according to 2 Corinthians 12 through these types of things is bring humility to us. Let's think about another way that God's people can contract the illness and God says no to their prayers and it makes them more like Jesus. Uh, If you would like to, you could turn to Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is written by Moses and in Psalm 90, Moses writes about the brevity of life. And he unpacks in multiple places the truth that our years are but a mere breath compared to God's eternality. And in verse 12, here's what Moses says. He says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. So some of us, through neglecting to number our days, to to number your days means to realize, I'm not going to live forever. And I need to have a sense of urgency with how I'm using my life. What am I spending my time on? What am I giving myself to? I better number my days and realize they're not going to last forever. I have a finite amount of days. That's what numbering your days means. So some of us, through neglecting to number our days and to take in the sobering truth that we don't have an unlimited amount of time here on earth, some of us are living very foolishly. We, have, we don't have a heart of wisdom. We have a heart of foolishness. Here's some of the ways that manifests itself. Some of us take our loved ones for granted. We don't give them the time and attention that they deserve. We don't see God as we ought to. We neglect giving our lives to God in a worthy manner. We waste tons of time on banal things on the internet, on TV, on social media, and we spend ourselves in what the Bible calls worthless pursuits. And for some of us, our lives and our days, they are wasting away in frivolities. They are wasting away in sin. And we rarely give thought to the sobering reality that if we're given a finite number of days and those days could come to an end at any time, how then should I spend my life? Some of us almost never even think about that. Well, in Psalm 90, verse 12, which I just read, Moses tells us that when we learn to number our days, we gain a heart of wisdom. Now, true wisdom is able to rightly recognize what the most important things in your life are according to the word of God. And then true wisdom is going to order your life to give the most significant amounts of time and energy to the best things that God has for you. And so when you have a scare in your life, like contracting the coronavirus, 
If you survive that scare, God doesn't want you to go, go back to sleep and keep wasting your days. Instead, one of the great blessings of God in those seasons is you learn to number your days. You learn to build your life around what really matters. You learn to build a lifestyle of worship into your uh, your life. You learn to build the intake of the Word of God into your life. You learn to build meaningful prayer into your life. You learn to build fellowship with God's people and service to Christ's kingdom into your life. You learn to build a strong marriage and to have quality time with your spouse in your life. You learn to invest heavily into the spiritual, emotional, and physical good of your children. And so these kinds of moments when you, when you get the coronavirus and you're hospitalized by a deadly illness and then you survive, they cause you to make permanent, wonderful changes to your life for the rest of your days if you go through them rightly. So as the sick person who has the coronavirus wrestles with their life on their sickbed and ponders how he or she will spend his life differently for the sake of God if he's given more days, that person then prays to be healed. And in due time, God will answer that prayer for many people. Many sick people, most people who get the coronavirus, they will recover from the sickness. And most people, if they have eyes to see and they're going through this in a God-centered way, they will learn in their recovery that God is a healer. If you have eyes to see, if you get the coronavirus or anything else and you are healed, then your heart will be full of the sweetness of Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3. Here it is. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, and who heals all your diseases. And so for the believer who has eyes to see, as his heavenly Father heals him, the man who is made well, he gets up, and he uses his healing to glorify Christ, He learns to number his days and he reorients his life as he gets a wonderful and fresh reminder of the sweet mercy of God. So for a person like that, who has that happen to them, if they would have never contracted the virus, they would have continued to waste their time on sin in the world and useless things. Some people would continue to remain hardened and arrogant without a sickness. So tell me, for the person who is living in these types of sins or wasting away in their life, and they prayed and asked God to keep them from getting sick, but found that the answer was no, and that God saw to it that you actually got the virus, and as a result, you become more loving, more humbled, you number your days, and you build your life on the rest, uh, you build the rest of your life on the best things, the things of God, tell me, was God loving to you or unloving in saying no to answering your prayer when you asked that He kept you from the, getting the virus? He's loving. God is wiser than us. He has more understanding than us. And there's 10 trillion things God could do through us getting the coronavirus. So someone here gets it. I'm not saying you're prideful or you're not loving or what. I'm just giving some examples. Maybe you are, uh, maybe you're not. There's all kinds of things God could do. I'm just trying to give you some illustrations of how God can say no to your prayer. You're getting sick. Bang! Even though you have 50 bottles of hand sanitizer, you are sick! Why would He do that? There's so many loving reasons why He would do that. I've just given you a couple of examples. Now, for other people, there will be some believers who will pray for protection from the virus. Please don't let me get this, Lord. My health is compromised. And God's answer to that prayer will be no. And they will get it, and then they will get sick. And when they are sick, just like with the person I described in the earlier example, while they were sick, while they are sick, they will pray that God will heal them. And for some of these people, the answer to that prayer will also be no. And they will die. 
And God didn't give them what they asked in prayer, even if they had tons of faith. Now, some people, I don't know how many of you, I, mean, I, I, I think I know Rick's seen it before, maybe Augustina, maybe Matt, but I don't know how many of you have been around a deathbed situation. Most of the time, when people are about to die, they know they're about to die. And for some of these people, like the thief on the cross in the Bible, Matthew 26, I believe, maybe it's chapter 27, these people will be able to hear the gospel before they die. Now, I have personally been at the deathbed of several people before. And I have also had the privilege of seeing many of these people accept Christ and be saved in the final hours of their lives. And I've watched these same people, some people that I knew for decades were the meanest, nastiest people I ever met in my life. I watched them die with incredible peace and incredible joy after accepting Christ. Now, part of what brought these people to a place of openness to the gospel was the realization that they were about to die. And so when God left all of their prayers for healing unanswered, and when God made it obvious that their illness would lead to death, and when I stood there and prayed for those people, said, God, heal them, and He said, no. It was in these things that their hearts were prepared to receive Christ, and they were able to come to saving faith that they might spend eternity with the Lord rather than in hell. And so when all of the prayers for healing go unanswered, and when God uses a death sentence to soften a sinner's heart, remember the beginning of the sermon. God is sovereign, but He uses real things. If He chose someone for salvation, there's going to come a point He's going to use a real thing to soften a hardened heart so they hear the gospel. And sometimes that's a deathbed. So when He uses a deathbed to soften a sinner's heart, and then He sends a messenger of the gospel to lead a dying person to Christ, that they might be saved, even though they have nothing but a lifetime of sin behind them, tell me, is God unloving in how He has dealt with that person? By no means. So for, those, for some of these people, they come to know the Lord in their final moments. I've seen it happen several times. They receive His Spirit, they're made completely new, and though they may only spend one day or one hour on this earth as a new creation in Christ, they will spend eternity singing about the mercy of God who was so kind that He saved a sinner at the last second even though that person spent a lifetime rebelling against God. Like I said, I've seen this happen before many times, and if you're present when it happens, nobody shakes their fist at God. And gets mad at him for allowing the person to die. But instead, everyone praises his glorious grace. And so for the believer who dies of this coronavirus or dies of anything else. The believer finds that the end of his days have come. It's time to meet the Lord. And the death and resurrection of Christ that brought you salvation, it has so transformed the experience of death for you that Paul rightly calls death gain for the believer in Philippians 1.21, which we looked at last week. So God uses the coronavirus to bring you into the presence of Jesus and His answer to your prayer for healing was no. Do you think when you go into the, into the presence of Jesus, your first thing is to be to, to complain? How can He didn't heal me? Why do I even waste my time praying? You're not going to do that. You're going to rejoice and be glad in God's wisdom and God's understanding that told you no when you need to hear no. And so as the believer, is, his life is taken through the coronavirus, the believer is going to come to the presence of Christ. And the believer is going to go from 
having many moments in his life of sweet worship. Uh, for, for a believer who walked with the Lord for a significant amount of time, they've had many wonderful times of singing to God and repenting to God and praising God and thanking God and rejoicing in God and confessing sin to God and pleading with God in times of desperation and need and celebrating God's goodness in times of joy and peace and weeping to God in times of conviction or deep pain and trusting in God in times of great confusion, grief, and loss. There's many times for the believer where we experience God as our shield and our defender and our strong tower and our deliverer and our healer and our bridegroom and our provider and our savior and our redeemer and our forgiving and loving father and as he who is the source of our life in every single way. That's what we experience when we walk with God in this life. And so if you have walked with Him for a significant amount of time, and then you get the coronavirus, and then you die, all of those God-centered experiences in your life are going to just transfer right into His presence. And all those good moments you've had with the Lord are just going to go... They're going to be put on steroids and be better than you could ever imagine. And you'll see him face to face, Philippians 1.23. And so when that type of person dies of the coronavirus, he goes to glory. He's fully freed from sin now. He's fully freed from hardships and trials and calamities. And there's nothing but the undiluted presence of Christ that he's going to worship and praise in concert with other saints, the holy angels and all heavenly creatures. He is not going to think God has been unfair, cruel or unloving by not answering his prayers for healing from the coronavirus. It's just not going to happen. So, real believers are going to have different experiences in relation to the coronavirus. It's very important for you to understand. Because if you get it, and you thought you weren't going to get it, you might wrongly question your salvation. Or if you don't get it, and your friend or your brother in Christ gets it, you might wrongly judge, oh, what did you do? You'll become Job's friends. Like... Some of us might get it, and some of us might not. We might all get it, and everybody in this room dies. Or we may not, we'll all be spared. I, we don't know. But we know God's answers to our prayers to keep us from getting it are going to serve the purpose of Romans 8, 28, and 29. Working all things for our good, and the specific good is whatever will most conform us to the image of Christ. That's what God cares about. He cares about that way more than He cares about your health. He cares about your health for the purpose of conforming you to Christ, which means sometimes he may take away some of your health. And sometimes he may restore it and strengthen it. He knows what he's doing. Okay. So I said at the beginning of the sermon, we would talk about making decisions in relation to the coronavirus at the end, but I first wanted to lay some things out. So we're, we're getting there. Let me put one last thing here in place. If we anchor our souls in the gospel during the times of coronavirus outbreak, if we trust a good God who holds every molecule in his hands and will work all things, including viruses, for the good of his people to conform us to Christ, then there's no need for us to be overcome by fear or panic in any way. I just gave you some examples of how the goodness of God shines through even if some of our prayers aren't answered and even if a worst case scenario happens. So there's no reason to be afraid. We can can totally be undergirded by God's peace during this time and whatever He brings into the life of us as believers, it's going to be what's best for our souls and God's wisdom and understanding, which is infinite, is going to govern how He decides to love us in this season. So, knowing that he's in complete control of the coronavirus and he works every detail to conform us to Christ, does that mean we're not trusting God if we wash our hands? Or if we take reasonable precautions? Well, if you're washing your hands every 10 seconds, because you're in a panic and you're looking to sanitizer or dish soap or dove bars of soap to be your savior, you're in sin. 
If you think mountains of toilet paper are going to de- deliver you or a huge meat freezer uh, full of stuff that you're hoarding in utter sheer terror and panic, you're in sin. If the reason you're doing it is because you're basically making yourself your own deliverer and you have no trust in God. Now, having said that, for the one whose heart is undergirded with faith and confidence in God, I believe it is totally valid, biblically speaking, for believers to take reasonable measures in trying to protect themselves and others from this virus. There's nothing wrong with having a freezer full of meat or some extra supplies on hand, provided that you're doing it as one who trusts God. and just These are just some precautions, but they're not my saviors. There's nothing wrong with that. And I have a text for this. Please turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 23. I think this this passage, there are others, but I think this passage is just so helpful uh, in in thinking about this stuff. There's There's no room for even misinterpreting it. It's very clear. Now, for those of you who don't, may not know the context of verse 23 of Hebrews 11, uh, this verse is referring to the uh, events of the Exodus in chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Exodus. In chapter 1 and 2, Pharaoh issued an order demanding that the Jewish males who were born were to be taken to the Nile and killed. That's what happens in chapter 1 of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 2, Moses is born and his parents know that he's special and so they don't obey the edict to kill their son. And so that's the story that's being referred to here in Hebrews 11.23. And I want us to make some key observations that I think are super helpful about times like the coronavirus. Hebrews 11.23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Isn't that a crazy verse? It's amazing everything that's joined together in this verse. Let's observe them. First, notice the text says that the parents of Moses were not afraid of the king's edict. That's what it says at the end of the verse. They were not afraid. Second, I want you to also notice that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, verse 23 begins by telling us these parents were living by faith. Look at it again. By faith. Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. They hid him by faith. And now look. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. So they're not afraid of the king and they're living by faith and they hid the baby. All that's joined together in this verse. Now I can hear some misguided people saying right now, well, if they really trust in a sovereign God and they really believe that He's in control, well, how come they're lacking faith? Why are they living in fear and hiding the baby? They wouldn't hide the baby if they trusted God. Could you hear that? I I, I could hear that. I'd probably even think that. You know, stuff. And this is why I love the Bible. This is why we can't be so attached to theology and theological statements that we miss verses like this that would cross what would seem like logical conclusions from a theology of the sovereignty of God. Listen to the words of Scripture. The Bible tells us here, when they hide the baby, in no way are they lacking faith and in no way are they operating in a sinful fear. Instead, they recognize that though God is sovereign over all things, He uses things in this life to accomplish His will. At the spiritual level, Moses wasn't killed by Pharaoh because God preserved his life and it wasn't his time to die. That's the highest ultimate reason Moses didn't die. But at the earthly level, One of the instruments God used to keep Moses alive was the fearless and faith-filled actions of his parents who took wise precautions to save their son by hiding the baby and thereby saving his life. They did that. I'm not even just pulling the story and saying, hey, Moses' parents did this. See, we should do it. This is the Holy Spirit-inspired interpretation of that action. It was full of faith and had no fear. Mic drop.
Let's consider another very similar story. Matthew 2, verse 13 through 15. Herod was seeking to kill baby Jesus. Now, Jesus is, baby Jesus is fully God, fully man. Baby Jesus could have just been like, wah, and Herod disintegrates. But what, what happens in this story? Herod purposes to kill Jesus, right? And the angel appears to Joseph and Mary, and he does it. They don't say, ah, oh, just stay right there, trust God. Jesus is God in the flesh right there with you. Herod will never accomplish it. They don't say that. The angel doesn't say that. The angel says, Herod's going to kill the baby. Get up in the middle of the night. Mary just had a baby. Get up in the middle of the night and go to Egypt. Get out of here. That's what the angel says. And so, baby Jesus could have just snapped his fingers and killed Herod. Nevertheless, the way God kept, God the Father kept baby Jesus safe was having his human parents make human, prudent, natural decisions to leave Egypt and live in Egypt until Herod was dead. And so again, at the spiritual level, the Father was preserving the human life of Christ so that Christ can fulfill the ministry God gave Him. All throughout the Gospels, we hear about these threats on Christ's life. And it says everywhere, His time had not come yet. His time had not come yet. His time had not come yet. So at the divine, spiritual, sovereignty of God level, that's why baby Jesus was spared. Because His time hadn't come yet. But at the human level... In time and space where earthly things that matter play out, God used the fleeing of Joseph and Mary to ensure baby Jesus would not be killed. We just we, we, we can't be wiser than the Bible. And so when we recognize God is sovereign and God is in control, I think it would just be wrong for us to presume on His grace and not respect the way in which God has made His creation. Cause and effect is, is God's idea. I drop this Bible, what's going to happen? It's going to fall to the floor because of gravity. That's, that's going to happen. Could God decide to suspend my Bible in the air and have it flip and make a paper airplane out of Romans 8 and hit Matt in the head with it and say, see, this is for you? Yeah, He could do that. But that's not how He's made His creation. Nor Yes, He's sovereign and He can bend the rules of natural order. But God's natural order came from God. And He uses those things. And He expects us to respect that. Jesus, God in the flesh, did not, when Satan tempted Him, throw Himself off, off the cliff to test God. Because Psalm 91 says He will not strike His foot against us. He says, no, get, that, get behind me, Satan. I ain't doing that. So, when we recognize God is sovereign and God's in control, it would be wrong for us to presume on His, His grace and not respect the way in which God made His creation. So, tonight, if you go home and God forbid your house is on fire, what are you going to do? Are you going to open the book of Daniel and say, I'm Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I'm going to sit here with my kids and the, the fire will not touch us? I hope you don't do that. Get out of the house! Or you're going to die. If your child, if after this service, somebody's driving through the parking lot and JJ or Zoe starts to run out into the parking lot, I hope someone standing nearby is going to say, well, I guess God will send a big wind or an angel to grab him or something. Go grab the kid. So, similarly... If there is a dangerous virus ripping through the city and the country, it's okay to wash your hands. You're not denying the faith if you do that. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're going to carefully consider your actions and pray that you won't get sick, there's nothing wrong with that. You should do that. But you should do it as one who trusts in God's good and sovereign plan for your life. If you hoard 50 bottles of hand sanitizer, you wash your hands every five minutes, you won't go anywhere at all, and you pray incessantly that God will keep you from getting sick, and then you get sick, and then you just flip out, and there's no God? Man, you have missed this. There's a right way to take precautions, and there's a wrong way to take precautions. 
There's a way to do it that's filled with worldly fear and that thinks your sanitizer is your savior. And then there is ways that's trusting God and I just understand how he made his creative order or his, his order in creation. I'm going to you know, do the best that I can and trust God with the results. Those are two very different things. And I think similarly, as you consider if someone is in need during this time and you have a chance to minister to them and take them food or something like that, what do you think you should do? This is my opinion. I think you should just do it. There's nothing wrong with showing love to others, even if it might be risky for you. And I think you could do it in a way that takes precautions. Let's say someone in the church got sick and they're, you know, not going out anywhere and they don't have any food. And they contact us and one of us decide, you know, I'm going to take you some food. I'm going to take the risk. And I get some food and we go over to the house. But going into the house, maybe we put on some gloves. And we open the door, you know, so we're not getting germs there. And we don't hug the person, maybe, because of that. And we set the stuff down, and they say, thank you. We say, okay, goodbye. And we go home, and we wash our clothes, and wash our hands, and take a... You didn't, like, deny your act of love because you took some wise precautions. There's nothing wrong with that sort of thing. And if you want to take that kind of risk for the sake of love, I think that just that also just fits right in line with the heart of the New Testament. So, <clears throat> while you do all of your praying and your worshiping, and while you're filling your mind with hopeful thoughts about God, and while you're taking wise precautions, and while you may also embrace some risk for the cause of love and the service of the gospel, you need to do so as one who hopes in God and trusts God with whatever results take place. Psalm 33, verse 20 and 21. Our soul waits for the Lord. He's our help. He's our shield. For our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. And lastly, to any unbeliever that maybe is listening online or may even be here, you have a lot bigger problem than the coronavirus. You're on a path that does not know God. And the way that path ends is you standing before Him in judgment. And if you have not lived a perfect life and all you have is yourself, you know how that judgment's going to go? God is going to condemn you to hell forever. It does if you get the coronavirus as an unbeliever and then you die and you meet your maker, he's going to judge you. Even if you have 50 bottles of hand sanitizer and a mountain of toilet paper, those things might be beneficial for cleaning the body, but they cannot clean one thing off of your soul. The only way to be ready to deal with the coronavirus is to know Jesus Christ who died on a cross for your sins, who lived a perfect life in your place, who was risen from the dead and who can save your soul. If you're not walking with Him, you are totally unprepared for the coronavirus no matter what you have stored up in your house. And if you do know Him, you are more prepared than any trillionaire unbeliever who's got like a... (laughs) Wartime, you know, he could live for 10 years off of what he's got stored in. You're 10 million times more prepared for the coronavirus if you know Jesus Christ. Because even if it kills you, it brings you to God. And so let the coronavirus and this fear of death, let it be the beginning of the fear of the Lord for you and lead you to seek Him and put your faith in Jesus Christ who died for your sins to save you so that nothing can touch your soul, even the coronavirus. So, that is our message tonight. I know there's a, there's a ton of things that I didn't say, that I can't say. We already went an hour and three minutes, so. Um, are there any questions or comments? Nope. Okay, well, let's pray, and then Matt will close us in song. Father, we thank you for 
your sovereign rule over all things, uh, including the coronavirus and every detail of our life. God, we thank you for the anchor of our soul, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we know we are yours, that you keep us. You will not let your blood-bought children turn from you. No one can snatch us out of your hand. Lord, we rejoice in those things. We thank you that you take every detail of our life and use it to conform us to the image of Christ for those of us who know you. And God, we do pray and ask you, please spare all of us and our loved ones. We don't want the coronavirus. Please protect us from it, God. Please let this virus virus just die off quickly, Lord God, and just let society reset back to normal. God, that's our prayer. Um, At the same time, we pray these things, obviously, in in glad deference to your wisdom. You know how to be God a lot better than we do, Lord. And so we just, we do ask for these things, but we also ask, Lord, that uh, the glory of the name of Jesus Christ would just ring throughout this uh, globe. We pray that people will be saved through this crisis. We pray that the believers will be grown and strengthened and sanctified in their faith. We pray, Lord God, that you would just uh, gain many praises for Jesus Christ as our world goes through this crazy season right now. God, we trust you. We are glad in you. We rejoice in you. We hope in you, God. And so we just pray you'll fill us with peace as we fill our minds with the good things of God. And we pray for these, these things in Jesus' name. 